Welcome guests to the Ghost Library. I'm Jay and I'm to be your librarian and, and guide for today. Around this time of the year, the realms between the living and the dead are close together. Today, you will be able to interact with a few legendary writers and artists who have passed, including Brian Stoker, author of Dracula, Mary Shelley, author of, Fra of Frankenstein, Edgar Allan Poe, and several more. During these interactions, you'll be able to ask a series of questions, but please, shy away from reminding that they're dead. That upsets them. We wouldn't want anyone traveling back to the grave with them now, do we? As you enter the library, try not to be alarmed. We keep the library dim and hazy to keep the ghosts company. As you enter, watch the space and people around you. Try not to crowd and ghost might disappear. When you're done interviewing with another host, we encourage you to go and talk to another, as they're only here for one day, so make the most of your time. Make sure to exit out of the back portal, and if you're done beforehand, wait there for your teacher. Good luck and stay safe. You may now enter. Allow me to ask you a question. Do you believe in fairies, leprechauns, ghosts, vampires? If not, surely you believe in the devil, right? Whether you do or don't, it does not matter. Let me tell you, I grew up with plenty of these stories. And it seems as if this devil has been following me ever since I was a mere child. When I was younger, I was born with an illness, an illness of blood, that no man's medicine could explain. Eventually, however, I realized I was not cursed. I was conflicted. After me on the second stronger. Now six foot three inches. My name is Bram Stoker. I went to college. I grew up in Dublin. I became an athlete. I fell in love with the theater. Thanks to my dear friend, Henry Irving, my God. Henry was one of the greatest actors to have ever touched the stage. But it does not matter what I did. I could not cure my conflicted mind. I married a woman who bore me child and yet I did not love her. I had asked myself, why am I so different than all of those who were around me? And it wasn't until I met Oscar Wilde that I received the answer I so longed for, you see. Society threw Oscar away for his love of men. And yet, he was a man of my nature. I had had this same yearning lust, this, this desire, that society would have thrown me away for, and thus my realization of Dracula. He was the personification of all these demons that I faced. He was that devil that they painted Oscar to be and would have painted me. To them, we were nothing more, nothing less, but blood-sucking narcissists. Oh, but please, swear to secrecy about what has been spoken here today. For if you don't, it may be too late. Oh, my God, I don't mean to scare you. I've been talking for so long. Do you have any questions for me? Hello there, folks. I didn't see you there. Just having a drink, you know? Getting ready for a show, you know? Loosen up. I'm Frank Sinatra, or as many people know me as Old Blue Eyes, or the Chairman of the Board. I'm from Hoboken, New Jersey. I was born to an Italian parent who were immigrants from Italy, you know? Growing up, I always wished I, you know, had a sister, someone I could protect, or a brother who could keep me out of some trouble. There in Hoboken, I started out as a professional singer because I was inspired by Bing Crosby. Good old Bing Crosby. I always wanted to be like him. He was my idol. So there in Hoboken, I started out as a professional singer. Or at least I thought I was professional. Started singing big band numbers, you know. Harry James, you know. He was a great trumpet, in fact. And also the Tommy Dorsey orchestra. Mind if I sing a bit of one of our songs? It's called All Nothing at All. Oh. Or nothing at all. Yeah. Half a love never appealed to me. Yeah. Not so bad, huh? Well, I kept singing many big band numbers as those, but uh, my parents weren't so, you know, supportive of the whole singing thing, you know? Oh, it was just a waste of time or like a, like a hobby. But I showed interest, folks. Interest, interest, interest. That interest had me later in 1940, you know, Joined a group called the Rat Pack. Oh yeah, 
really loved that group, you know, it was full of wild entertainers, such as me, you know, Sammy Davis Jr., uh, Joey Bishop, and Dean Martin, you know, we were famous for our wild shenanigans, boy, we were famous for our love of women, yeah, we loved the ladies, you know, we uh, sung a ton of music and done lots of crime movies, and that in fact, you know, one of them are called uh, Oceans, of, Oceans of Leather, actually, yeah, really, really, really good, really good movie. There was someone else in the group I really didn't enjoy too much, you know, he's the odd one out there. Peter Locke, yeah, that was his name. We had a disagreement about a great friend of mine, JFK. You may know him as uh, John F. Kennedy, as a matter of fact. Yeah, we were good friends, you know, it was a political disagreement that we didn't really, you know, see on. You know? But uh, I kicked him out of the group, you know. I went my way and he went his, you know, and he was gone. Well, as you can see, I'm not too happy when I drink, so... Uh, any questions there, kiddo? Oh, hello. You caught me at a great time. I was just working on a musical adaption of Oliver LaFarge's Laughing Boy. My name is Lorraine Hansberry, and I am a writer. I absolutely love writing. The only thing to come close to my love for writing would be using my voice to fight for black rights and advocating for my people. The most memorable protest I participated in was one against racial discrimination at NYU. This is where I met my ex-husband and best friend, Robert Numeroff. Many people would assume that we'd want nothing to do with each other after the divorce, but really, that isn't true. We have very similar beliefs and we still work together. And if it weren't from the song he wrote me, Cindy, oh Cindy, then I wouldn't have written The Crystal Stair. I often reflect on my younger days. I was free and described as a rebel. But really, I just wanted to see the world and what it had to offer. I guess this is why I found myself wandering the streets of Harlem and experiencing new forms of art on every corner. The big city inspired me to write so many beautiful short stories and plays. It also helped me come to terms with my sexuality. This is why today, I'm an advocate for gay rights. None of this would be possible without my family, though. These are the people who supported me when I was only eight years old and a brick was thrown through my window. You see, I'm the youngest of four. My parents raised my siblings and I to always stick together and fight for what we believed in. Above all, there are two things that are to never be betrayed. The family and the race. Especially my father. I was only 15 when he died. American racism helped kill him. But this made us stronger. This is what gave us the motivation to keep pushing when we were oppressed because we had lost someone worth fighting for. And it wasn't all bad after my daddy had gone because we were visited by people like Langston Hughes and Paul Robinson, Jesse Owens and Duke Ellington. It was nice to know that we were seen by other prominent black people. Most people know me as the famous playwright who wrote A Raisin in the Sun. I don't blame them. It was voted the best play of the year and was the first play to be performed on Broadway that was written by an African-American, me. I just hope that people are able to get the true message from it. Social progress and black excellence. The characters were based off of my family and friends after all. For example, Nanny, my mama, was awfully similar to Mama Younger. And my daddy Carl, and ways just like Big Walter. All of my stories had people in mind though. You see, you keep the people you love close to you. My best friends are Nina Simone and James Baldwin. These are the people who, yes, my ex-husband included, that I told about my pancreatic cancer. It's our secret. These are the people who have my back. And in 63, I joined the civil rights movement because nothing is gonna stop me from fighting for what I believe in. No segregation, no Robert Kennedy, and no cancer can ever stop me from being Lorraine Vivian Hansberry. Goodness, I've just been going on and on. Have you any questions for me? Forgive me, I didn't notice you there. Sometimes I get so immersed in my writing. The librarian informed me I would be speaking with you all today about my life. Not that it's an exciting story. Don't be frightened. Come, gather round, and we'll begin. Let me start by introducing myself. My name is Edgar A. Poe. I had a rather unfortunate childhood. My parents passed away early on in my life, and that was only the first of many dreadful events that would occur over the next few decades. You see, 
Misfortune seems to follow me everywhere I go. I'll admit, I've grown rather fond of it, as if it were an old friend. It's part of the reason I find myself writing about it so often. Melancholy is to me what air is to other people. It's always present, always there, always lurking in the corners of my mind. I like to explore it, to see how much the human brain is truly capable of. The mind is quite a fascinating place, you know. But I digress. When I was 13, I was separated from my siblings and sent to live with John and Francis Allen on their tobacco plantation in Virginia. I never liked John. He wanted me to follow in the family tobacco business, but even at that young age, I could hear the pen calling out to me. When I began my university education, John refused to help pay for my tuition and I was forced to leave school. I joined the military for some time but was eventually kicked out. That's when I decided I was going to take my career as a writer more seriously. Of course, John didn't support me at all, so I did what any sensible person would do. I ran away. To Boston. That's where I live now with my wife, Virginia. I've written several poems and stories such as The Gold Bug, The Telltale Heart, and one of my personal favorites, The Raven. Allow me to recite a piece of it for you. Once upon a midnight dreary, while I pondered, weak and weary, over many a quaint and curious volume of forgotten lore. While I nodded, nearly napping, suddenly there came a tapping, as of someone gently rapping, rapping at my chamber door. Tis some visitor, I muttered, tapping at my chamber door. Only this, and nothing more. If you'd like to hear more of it, you'll have to come back later, I'm afraid. I've only got so much time to speak with you, and I'd like to use that time well. I've been trying to make a living as a writer, but it isn't easy. Still, I can't give up. There are still so many unanswered questions, so much left to wonder about and explore. If I could crack even one of life's secrets, I'd be satisfied. Well, Traveller, is there any question or idea you wish to share with me? Go on, don't be shy. I won't bite. Hello, darling. My name is Maya Angela but I was born Marguerite Johnson in St. Louis, Missouri, 1928. That would make me 43 this year, and I've done quite a bit so far by using the wisdom I've gained to fuel the words born under my pen. When I was 16, I moved away from home to raise my son Guy on my own, and I've explored so many careers since then. I attended San Francisco Labor School, and I was the first black woman streetcar conductor. I was a calypso dancer and gained popularity through my performances. I performed in clubs around San Francisco and I toured Europe with the opera Porgy and Best Production. A few years later, I moved to New York City after I met John Killens and he urged me to focus on my writing. I visited 22 countries and learned five beautiful languages. Spanish, French, Hebrew, Italian, and Fonte. After my move to New York, I joined the Harlem's Writers Guild, where I met James Baldwin, Rosa Guy, and other major authors, and where I was able to hone my poetic skills. I was also invited to serve as a Northern Coordinator for the Southern Christian Leadership Conference under Dr. Martin Luther King. Following my work with Dr. King, I moved to Cairo with my son where I worked as a freelance writer and a senior editor for the African Review. But I didn't stay for long and returned to New York in the mid-60s. My friends, James Baldwin and Robert Loomis, encouraged me to write an autobiography. I declined at first. I was a poet, not a novelist. But then Robert said it would be impossible for me to do, so I thought, maybe I will try it. I recently finished my first autobiography, which I titled, I Know Why the Caged Bird Sings. I decided to focus on my youthful years and share the wisdom I've gained thus far. And I've already begun working on my next that picks up where the first one left off. I'm so grateful that I've been able to explore so many of my passions in life. Oh, I've been going on and on. Do you have any questions? Oh, hello. How are you? Sorry, I didn't see you there. So, doggy. 
I'll just make it a version of my song, a change gonna come. You know the one that goes. I was born by the river. Anyways, my name is Sam Cook. Make sure you emphasize the E then the Cook mention my name. I was born in Clarksdale, Mississippi. But I was raised in West Chicago where my father was a minister of the Baptist Church. See my mother, Anna Mae Cook. She was so warm and feeling like her dinners. She made my favorite red beans and rice, put the cornmeal on the side like I like it. Gospel was always the thing I grew up with. Me and my siblings had a group when I was 15, that's when I started singing. Called the Highway QCs. I was the lead singer, of course. After that, gospel was always my thing. But I knew, so I need something that's gonna make my thing different. Something, something that's gonna change. So that's what I did. Pop job. At the age 26, I did my hit song, You Send Me. You send me. It was a song of my career. It charted number 94 in the top 100 for six weeks. Aretha Franklin always, always also did a version of it in 1968. She's sweet. Huh? You may know some of my other songs. Wonderful World, Cupid, Twisting the Night Away. No? Well, I was one of the first inductees into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. Also, into the Rhythm and Blues Hall of Fame in 2013. I had two wives, not the same time though. Dolores, Deborah. I had two, three beautiful children. Tracy, Linda, Vincent, no oh, Vincent. See, Vincent was my son, my dearest son, my only son. Vincent died at the age of 18, he drowned. I was drinking. I didn't know what happened. I just went to go look for him and there he was. My back patio door was open. Now I found him, I was too late. Vincent is what motivates me in now my day. He's what keep me sane. I think about my time. My two youngest daughters, well, not so much. See, Tracy, she writes poetry. She get it from her daddy. Well, my other daughter, she not so good. When it comes to stuff like that, I have to check myself. I go to the club and dance with all the young honeys. This is something I like to do. Under these spotlights, this young age knew I knew where I belong. It's where I feel at home. Work hard and play hard is where I stick to. It's my time. Speaking of working, I gotta get this song done. Y'all any more questions? Go ahead. Oh, hello. You aren't intruding on anything, I promise. My name is Mary Godwin Shelley. What's your name? How delightful. Well, nothing too bad has happened recently. It's just, there's been a book published called Frankenstein. Have you got a chance to read it? Do you know the name of the author? Well, it was written by Shelley, but not the one that everybody thinks. See, it was me. I'm the one that wrote it. But people are having a hard time believing it. They assume it was my husband and I... Where are my manners? I am the wife of Percy B. Shelley. I met him when I was 16 years old. He was very fond of my father's work, so he would often come to my home to visit. My father was truly an amazing writer, yet he never took a liking to my way of writing. See, even as a mere child, I wrote tales of horror, and I used to test them out on my younger brother, but I would anger father. He was a journalist and a physical philosopher, so my tales of monsters were seen as nothing but a waste of time in his eyes. However, I see my father digging along well until found out about our entanglement. See, Percy was married to this woman whose name I shall not speak of because it didn't matter to me. We were already deeply entwined. But when we confessed our feelings for each other to my father, he told me if I continue to be seen with Mr. Shelley that he'll turn his back on me. So be it. I loved Percy. We would often take strolls to my mother's grave, and I i know that my mother would have supported my decision of being with Mr. Shelley. She was a writer as well. She's everything I aspire to be and more. She was ever so passionate about how women should be seen as more than just second-class citizens, and how they deserved an education, and how they shouldn't be treated like silly little ornaments to make a man look good. And 
That's why I grew fond of Shelly. He loved the way that my brain worked. I will say, my Percy is an amazing poet, but he leans more to the romantics, whereas I will. Frankenstein. Frankenstein was my feelings and my pain and my unforgiving torture. I birthed four children and watched all except for one die. It was soon after my first child passed. I had this strange dream. You know, the ones in which you see things you have never seen before. Now only explainable to you. I dreamt that baby had only been cold and all we had to do was wrap her by the fire and she lived. I woke up so terrified that all I could do was stare at the ceiling and try to control my breathing because I I knew there was no baby by my side. Funny thing is, most people try to forget their bad dreams but I wouldn't allow me to forget this one though. 1816, Percy and I got invited to his friend Lord Byron's house, where there was whole silly little writing competitions and they thought it would be funny to include me. <laughs> Lucky for me, the category was horror. Two weeks passed and the dream sparked an idea in my brain. An inhumane creature forged by heat and electricity. So you see, Frankenstein was my idea, not Percy's. It was mine. I'm sorry. I know you're only passing by, but do you have any questions? Can you see you there? Some know me as the King of Pop, but do they know the sacrifices? Come a little closer, I won't bite. I'm Michael Jackson and I'm 31. I was raised by my parents, Joe and Catherine Jackson. Together they had nine children, including me, but I feel like I was mostly raised by my mom. Even with nine children, she treated each of us like the only child. The earliest memories I have of her are her singing and holding me and singing songs like Cotton Fields and You Are My Sunshine. She sang to me and my siblings often. She wanted to perform the music she loved in front of others too, but knew from an early age that she couldn't do to her polio. She got over the disease, but not without a permanent limp. She decided it wasn't a curse, but a test from God. And she instilled in me a love of him that I will always have. My father saw what me and my brothers could do with that love and our voices and got them, me and them together to perform. We were now as the Jackson Five. As children, we were always performing, no matter the time of day. The other kids threw rocks at our windows, saying we would never make it, but we kept going and going, and we did. We made it. The Jackson 5 went everywhere and got all kinds of attention. It was scary at first, but we were grateful for all the love and support coming from everywhere and everyone. Because of my voice, I was invited to play the Scarecrow of the award-winning musical, The Wiz. The whole time was a period of stress and anxiety, even though I was enjoying myself. And the success definitely brought on loneliness, it's true. People think you're lucky. They think you have everything. They think you could go anywhere and do whatever you want, but that's not the point. I found myself craving the simple things like home, pets, freedom, fun. I feel like I've lost that at a young age due to the success, the judgment, the practicing. And I feel like no child should be left to feel like they've missed out on their childhood. When I felt I was ready, in 1984, I split with the Jackson 5 to launch my own solo career, where I produced fun albums like Off the Wall, Thriller, and Bath. I miss my family, but I felt the need to find myself. I'm currently working on my next album, Dangerous, which I want to feel different from my past albums, despite the past success. Through and through, the world is a fascinating place to be, like, you could be whoever you want. Wearing two gloves seems so ordinary, but a single glove was different and definitely my look. But also, 
I've long to believe that thinking too much about your look is one of the biggest mistakes an artist can make because an artist should let his style evolve naturally and spontaneously. You can't think about these things. You have to feel your way to them. And there's been times before a performance where things like that were bothering me, business or personal problems. And I would think, I can't go on like this. I, I can't perform like this. I don't know what to do. But when I get on stage, something happens. The rhythm starts, the lights hit, and the problems disappear. It's like God saying, yes, you can. Yes, you can. Just wait until you see this. Wait until you hear this. Whatever it is, it's yours. Excuse me for talking so long. What's your art and what is it to you? What inspires you? Oh, my apologies. Is it already time for us to begin? I'm sorry, I was just freshening up. Hi there. My name is Whitney Elizabeth Houston and I was born on August 9th, 1963 to two loving parents. My mommy and daddy are the light of my life. Easily two of my biggest supporters. I also have two older knucklehead brothers who I love very much, but I have to say it was my mother, Sissy Houston, my cousins, Dion and Dee Dee Warwick, who are also singers, and my honorary aunts, being the talented Aretha Franklin, that inspired me the most. It was almost impossible for me not to fall in love with both music and singing, and I was singing by the time I was seven years old. When I was 11, I joined my church's youth choir, and it was there that I sang solo for the first time good old New Hope Baptist Church. I sang, guide me, O thou great Jehovah. My memory serves me correctly. I think I still remember the words. Guide me, O thou great Jehovah. <laughs> I have to say, at that age, the only thing I was sure about was singing. I was 12 years old when I decided I wanted to sing professionally. I figured that God had given me something wonderful, that I ought to do something wonderful with it, you know? That being said, my parents made it a point to make sure I grew up a child and not a star. I had a very fun-filled youth. I got to go to summer camp just like any other kid during the summer. I sang background for a few big names in high school and even got into modeling when I was 17, but I didn't sign any contracts until I was good and grown. I was 19 years old when I signed my contract with Arista Records under the guidance of my dear friend Clive Davis. And in 1995, two years later, I released my debut album, self-titled Whitney Houston. <sighs> it's been what, about 10 years since then? Time sure does fly, doesn't it? Since then, I've released two projects, Whitney and I'm Your Baby Tonight. I released them sort of one after the other, so you would think that I would be worried, but they actually did amazing on the charts, earning me two number one albums on the Billboard 200 and nine number one singles on the Billboard 100. I was sort of just riding out the wave of all of this newfound attention, and now here I am. I just made my acting debut in Mick Jackson's The Bodyguard, and I'm so happy to be here with you all tonight. With that being said, can I be honest with you all? I never really wanted to go into film. I never really wanted to be an actor or a movie star. But in my mind, though it's obviously a little different from music, the film industry was just another world of entertainment I wanted to venture into. That was where my head was in 1991 when I signed my contract with 20th Century Fox. And the following year, The Bodyguard was released. I have to say though, the production sort of found me. I didn't really go looking for it. I read the script and I fell in love with the story, but I felt like it was way too heavy of a role for it to be my first. I held off on making a decision right away, but my soon-to-be co-star, Kevin Costner, he was so adamant about me taking on the role. He would call me up every day and tell me that he wouldn't go on and do the film without me. So finally I asked him, I said, Kevin, what is an established actor like you? Why do you want me to be the person to play this role alongside you in this movie? He told me that I had the diva quality that the role needed, and he knew that I could do it, and I knew that I could do it, but he went on to say, and furthermore, Whitney, there's no one else in Hollywood who can sing like you. And I told him that he was out of his mind, but since he was so determined, I decided to mull it over and see it through. It was definitely an experience, to say the least. Like I said, it was my first role, which made it tough in and of itself, and 
I had a lot of firsts that year. First movie, first marriage. I got married that year. My first baby. I felt like I was on top of the world. Everything was moving at a steady and comfortable pace. And I was able to carry on with filming throughout my pregnancy. It didn't really hinder me much. Everything was under control. And then it felt like an instant. My entire world was rocked. I had lost the baby that I was carrying during the filming of The Bodyguard. It was very painful to carry on to say the least, both physically and emotionally. I remember wanting time to just stop right then and there, even with so much going on. But alas, life goes on. And I had the medical procedure done and I was back on set the very next day. It was very hard, but with the love and support from my close friends and family, my loving husband Bobby, my cast and crew, I was able to push through and put forth something wonderful. And I do have to say, I think that it was worth it. God has blessed me so abundantly ever since. The Bodyguard did amazing in theaters, earning $16.6 .6 million opening weekend. My agent is ringing me nonstop trying to figure out what my next big project will be, but I don't really think the timing is right. I feel like filming can wait, recording can wait. I still have so much I want to see and do. And I have my whole life ahead of me to figure out what I'm going to do next. So I'm not really sure where I'll go from here, but I know that I'll get there by the grace of God. I feel like I've been going on for days. Where are my manners? Do you all have anything you would like to ask me? Oh, hello survivors. My name is Agatha Mary Clarissa Miller, popularly known as Agatha Christie. I was born September 15th, 1890 in a pretty large town called Devon, England. I've always had an appreciation for literature and learned how to read at the age of eight. I had a fairly good childhood up until 1901 when my father passed away. And watching the progression of him get worse and worse was like watching the moon reach its apex. It was terrible. As years gone by, I became my mother's rock her other half, and she existed through me. In 1914, I married a man named Archibald Christie. Boy, did I love him. And even though I knew his love was wrong for me, his love felt like placing a kidney back in its rightful place. I needed him to live. I needed him to breathe. Five years gone by, I gave birth to our beautiful child, Rosalind Christie. For so many years, I had been unsuccessful with my stories. I had been denied and ridiculed for writing as a woman. But my Rosalind helped me see that there's a light and there's a way. And that's when I started to craft the life of Detective Hercule Perot. He was the main character in most of my stories. And in 1920, I had my first successful story titled The Mysterious Affair at Styles. I was picked up by John Lane Publishing to write five more. This was my opportunity. This was my moment. This was my chance to inhale without questioning if I should, if I should exhale. And then, in the year of 1926, my other half, my creator, my mother died. And the only person I had drifted away like the stars in the sky. And even though her death wasn't a murder, it sure felt like one. The worst one. The one that cut so deep you can see a window of pain through your organs. See, I... If only I could go back in time. I would watch the light fade from my eyes slower. Less harsher. Less painful. <clears throat> my apologies. So, in the same year of 1926, my husband of 12 years, Archibald Christie, had an affair with a woman named Nancy Neal. And as soon as I found out, the air I needed to breathe suddenly became insufferable. The life source he gave me felt nothing short of death. I hated him, I despised him, I... He broke my heart so much I felt it viscerally in my chest. I couldn't take the pain anymore, so... So I ran away on December 3rd, 1926 at approximately 9.03 p.m. I kissed my baby Rosalind, my final goodbye, and I drove and I drove and I drove and I nearly went off a cliff. But I had to keep running. I even disguised myself as a male. 
Obviously, that didn't work because I'm here, but... Two weeks later, the police and my husband found me. Not too long after that, I filed for a divorce. It was sad, but four years later, I met a man named Max Mallowin. He was an honest man. And my new profound happiness encouraged me to write my most prolific and popular stories, like Death on the Nile and Murder on the Orient Express. I found who I am. And life became so much better when sadness stopped becoming my addiction and the horrors that haunt me at night could be used for something good. Anywho, enough with my chatter. Do you have any questions? Thank you.